Okay, so welcome everyone to um, our subject today on contract deli driven API delivery, uh, where we really want to sort of bring agility and speed to your API lifecycle. Uh, my name is Benjamin Farr, and I'm a specialist solution architect. Uh, you know, I've had sort of 20 years of technology and consulting experience across Australia and Europe, and um, you know, I like to publish things on my LinkedIn and YouTube channel to to help simplify. Um, complex things to, to a wider audience. And Tom, do you want to? Yeah, I'm Tom Corcoran. Um, I basically have two roles. I'm an API architect, uh, which role I'm uh, playing today, but I'm also an AI uh, business transformation specialist. And I like to blog on AI and also contribute to events like Red Hat Summit and Happy Days. Uh, so thanks. Good to be here. Back to you, Ben. So the agenda we have today is um, fairly simple. We've sort of done the introductions, but um, and then we'll sort of get into sort of um, with Red Hat. You know, we have our OpenShift based platform. We'll we'll sort of just lay lay the groundwork of where um, the API lifecycle fits in within that. Uh, then we'll sort of go into our API lifecycle, and we've got a sort of framework that we'll sort of go through. Uh, the various different steps of the API lifecycle and how contract driven can really help those different steps to to bring up this uh, to speed it up and and be more agile. And so you know it's only a small group today, so happy to have questions. Really can be interactive throughout, but we'll also uh, open up. We'll have plenty of time for questions at the end, I think, as well. Um, next slide, next one. So here we have. Um, our sort of reference architecture for our OpenShift platform, um, which is serving sort of our APIs um, and our API ecosystem today as uh, all the tools as part of the API lifecycle. So OpenShift can run on, um, you know, physical, virtual, private, public cloud. It really provides that abstract, um, abstract layer to give you that consistent uh, feel and, and ability to deploy across any of those um, uh, public private cloud uh, but as part of the APIs you know what we're used to is using a lot of Kubernetes uh, concepts within APIs uh, and these are provided by OpenShift as well as sort of the the cluster services of monitoring logging storaging and networking in particular um, all these are provided by the platform today uh, but the focus where you know if you're looking through the blue section there the focus where we will sort of talk to today is really across the application services uh, where we have sort of integration and messaging uh, data services um, you know being uh, backbone sort of messaging backbones and particularly in sort of developer services how do i design uh, build test mock my api as well so um, along sort of side um, one sort of subject we may not sort of touch on today, but you know, service mesh. Um, service mesh is a, is a key part of sort of API uh, for us, and that sort of integrates to um, a lot of products you'll see today, such as Three Scale. So if we go to the next slide, so let's have a look at the contract-driven API lifecycle. So this is the this sort of API lifecycle that we're going to sort of talk to today. Um, and as a first step, um, it's sort of like a Mobius loop. Uh, if you look at it, it's sort of like a, it's a figure of eight on its side. Um, as a first step, you know, we're sort of looking at, you know, what are, what is the strategy we're looking at? What are the API best practices? And if you start, if you look at your eyes down at the, in the bottom in the middle, um, you would start generally at the design step. So, and, and that's where we'll start today as well. How do you design? Um, with a contract-driven uh, API uh, approach first, and then how do you mock, test, implement, deploy, secure, and manage? So the part on the left is around building it, uh, deploying it, implementing it, and, and getting it to the manage stage. So once once it's there, you want uh, people to sort of discover it. You want to be able to, uh, you know, other developers to develop to it and easily consume that. And and so that's sort of the the, the second part that we'll have. So uh, if we go to the next slide, um, you'll just see the associated products we have um, with each of these stages. Now, 
this is a life cycle that we have sort of various products that can fill each stage. But um, often, you know, um, if we're sort of talking to sort of uh, customers in the field, they'll have their um, choice on, on a particular area and they're easily substituted. Um, so what we're sort of demoing today, what like does all fit together, but at the same time, it can fit together with sort of many other um, products that we sort of substitute uh, along the way. And we're going to look at de demos in each, each of these, in, in many of these tools that you see, in particular, um, API Designer, the Microx, uh, have, have a sort of look at Fuse, and in, in particular, three scale API management. So let's first talk about API strategy, though. And, and really, today, it's really got to focus on sort of the contract first. But before we start talking about contract first, let's look at the alternative, which many people may be familiar with. Code first development can be pretty straightforward if the consumer of your application has decided how they want the service to work. There is always a preliminary discussion between the developer and consumer about the data to be exchanged. And it is likely there is some notion of the contract for the service, but it's often implicit. So with this approach, small changes are inevitable and they take, but they do take that toll on the developer and the grind through the long process of making those updates and getting everything right. And because that contract isn't exactly explicitly spelled out, these changes act might actually break things because the developer and consumer may have a different understanding of the service's intended operation. And if you think about this in the context of microservices, you will start to appreciate you know, how difficult this can make development when you sort of you're not talking about you know, one API, you're talking about hundreds of APIs. For example, if the team responsible for the back end has not completed their tasks, how can the team working on the front end write and then test their code? And similarly, when two or more services need to provide the aggregated functionality, uh, those teams really need to have a solid understanding of integrating the applications with one another. You know, traditional methodologies, you would have to write a project plan, you have to be delivered by development teams, require, you know, a lot of upfront time to sort of get this right. And that goes against the, you know, grain of agile, you know, those fast feedback loops. So, you know, if you're adopting DevOps and microservices and you're not sort of seeing that value, um, you know, it may be because, you know, this contract first approach is, is something that you're missing. Um, and with code first approach, you know, um, the, the, you can see all the back and forth uh, elements in, in this diagram. Uh, and we believe an effective method to sort of mitigate all these back and forth is contract first development. So the next slide, next one. So contract first involves the business and technical folk coming together to come up with contract design. Um, today we're talking really open API specification. And you know, you're deciding on what it is before you implement it. And this design for approach is called contract first. And it's become more popular because it prevents the developer from wasting time while negotiating how the service should be provided. The focus really becomes more on the API and the purpose to fit the business model. You can immediately see in this diagram, you know, that the con the back and forth is sort of always is done up front. And then you know you leave the implementation details to the developer. But one thing, you know, teams will never get this right the first time, and it can be an iterative process because you know sometimes you, you know it is a design that sometimes there is no right answer, and business requirements do change quickly. So and and obviously new features are requested. But what is consistent on this approach is the API contract is sort of the source of truth and living document for your development teams. You know, when one team identifies an issue that requires an update to the contract, uh, you manage that document in version control so that everyone is aware and can communicate effectively around that contract. And when it's time for integration, you know, in my experience, um, you know, there's l many, much less issues around integrating those services, you know, when that contract is followed. So if you go to that next slide, thanks, Tom. Um, with API um, strategy. Now, contract first feeds into a number of good practices from API strategy. Uh, this is a book which was published uh, a couple of years ago, but still really stands the test of time. 
uh, it, it provides um, a lot of guidance around um, API strategy. Um, and I've highlighted a few in, in this slide here around stability requirements, lifecycle standards, technology do guidance, documentation standards. But if you think about you know, contract first, um, that really feeds into stability, lifecycle, documentation, creating the right environment, um, and also looking at APIs as products and enabling you to automation sort of the whole life cycle as well. So in summary, and, and the next slide, um, you know, contract first strategy, um, it enables development teams to work in parallel. So, you know, increasing that speed and agility. It reduces the cost of developing apps because you've got less back and forth. You're doing, it's almost like a shift left as you do sort of, we talk about in DevSecOps security, you're, you're shifting left as much as possible. Increases the speed to market. It allows more implementation choices because with a code first, I have to already uh, choose uh, how am I going to implement this? Uh, you know, the contract first, um, the developer gets that choice and can and, um, develop to his strengths. And it also, you know, ensures a good developer experience. So that's all I have to say from a from an API um, strategy point of view of contract first. And um, now we'll sort of get into each of the different sections. And uh, Tom will kick kick us off with sort of the the API designer. Thanks, Tom. Thanks, Ben. Um, so that was r really enlightening, and that is the precursor to the actual hands-on, the development of a strategy, of a contract, a first-based strategy, um, prior to ever uh, implementing the API lifecycle. But with that strategy in place, and with the requirements that it has brought us, we're now into the first uh, stage, first hands-on stage, if you like, which is the API uh, design stage here, followed by the API mocking and the t uh, testing. Now, for the uh, first uh, phase, the API uh, designer, we provide um, this this uh, tool uh, from Red Hat called the API designer um, that effectively allows um, an open API contract. That's our that's our standard that we're uh, we're building and using in terms of our API contract. Um, this GUI tool allows obviously non-technical uh, people as well as technical people to build out that contract either from scratch, uh, from absolutely from the ground up, or by taking um, an existing uh, open API contract that perhaps a Maven plugin might have spit out in um, in uh, regards to a particular uh, API implementation that you then want to add extra capability into. You want to add extra documentation. You might want to add examples into, etc. So you can do either. You can go from scratch or you can um, decorate or improve existing open API contracts. I'm going to go with the latter. Um, this is a an open a very simple open API contract with three endpoints. Uh, relating to locations. You can see that on the GUI, we can add uh, paths, we can add data types, add responses. Um, we can specify, as we have here with uh, JSON, the uh, consumption type of the API and what the API produces, and also this other data that's gonna get inserted after we've uh, finished into the JSON or the YAML-based open API specification. Let's take a look at the locations, for example. You can see with locations here, um, we could specify for any given path the um, the methods, the HTTP methods that we want to implement. And we simply go ahead, add summaries, add extra description that we want to uh, give to our end uh, users to describe how to use the API. And interestingly, for our point of view here, we can add a an example API, which you'll see uh, come into play in a moment when we talk about mocking the API. So that's just a simple little example um, that's going to be inserted for this endpoint into our open API specification. 
So now this tool has allowed us to design from scratch or to update and add whatever we need to into our existing open API spec. Uh, so let's go back. Um, and now we're into the testing and, and mocking phase. And to do that, we use a tool. It's a Red Hat backed community uh, supported tool called Microx. Um, also running on OpenShift like everything uh, here uh, today. So let's switch across now. I've already logged into Microx and I've already uploaded um, a similar API contract uh, like you saw a moment ago within the designer. Um, and when I go in to my locations API, you can see the different endpoints at different paths and yeah, useful for us in terms of the mocking capability is it's not very well formatted here, but that's the same um, payload JSON response example payload that we added into our example in the previous step. And Microx gives us a URL here um, that we can use uh, to provide a mock uh, version of our um, API. We're going to test that out here using our uh, API testing tool Postman. That's the same URL that you saw a second ago within Microx that it produced for us. And we can see here that it's going to respond to us uh, the um, API example uh, payload there. So what the mocking really allows um, and how this uh, contract first and approach with uh, Microx helps drive speed and agility, which is our theme today, it basically will allow the front end team and the back end team to work in parallel. Um, everybody's working to that contract, and the Microx component provides a, um, a temporary API back end that the front end team can use to build out their mobile app or web app or whatever it might be. All the while, the back end team can work to that contract. And in that way, the front end team are not waiting for the back end team to finish. So it allows this parallel, these parallel work streams and the whole delivery, delivery to be speeded up in that way. So um, let's go back to our slides here. I'm going to hand to Ben again. Thank you, Tom. So just to, in summary, um, the that API designer, you uploaded a, a contract there, but obviously you can also edit and, and produce a contract there from scratch as well, correct? Absolutely. Yeah. Excellent. So you've seen Tom sort of work in the API designer. You've seen sort of the mocking, you know, how you can easily produce a back, back endpoint from the API specification. Now I want to talk a little bit about, um, you know, how we can go from that contract into starting to implement. Uh, if we go to the next slide, thanks. So our core, um, integration technology that, that we have here at Red Hat is based is Red Hat Fuse, which is uh, based on Apache Camel. Now, Apache Camel um, works in a, you know, has, enough, has lots of connectors. So it has several hundred connectors. You can connect to almost any system. And it, it was sort of built with known integration patterns. So combining the two, you can pretty much take one endpoint to another and perform any sort of data translation enrichment um, work with sort of transactions, whatever you need, particularly those known integration patterns are all sort of out of the box. It can work on and off cloud and to simply develop, you're simply sort of uh, writing sort of the, the um, domain specific language or DSL that, that you see as an, a simple example there on the right. So that's saying from a Kafka topic to a GRC endpoint, there's nothing done in between, but that's the, that's the idea of, of what you can get to in a sort of a low-code environment to develop your integrations. If you go to the next slide. Now, the, the next sort of um, model that we're sort of, um, that's now available is using a Quarkus backend. Now, Quarkus is a, um, the sort of next Java framework. It reduces the amount of memory uh, footprint that you need to, to run a service in, in Java as well as um, reduces the startup speed. So it's really ideal for serverless applications. 
you know, uh, Java is only, um, if you look at sort of AWS stats, Java is about a 6% workload for running serverless applications. With, Cam with Camel and Quarkus, you can actually combine that to a native and compete with the likes of Go and Python. Now, uh, in this arrangement here, um, serverless, um, we're talking, you know, the extra sort of um, the added value you get from this new Camel and Quarkus is, as a developer, I don't really have to worry about my Maven project as well. Um, I can simply write that DSL, create that integration file, run the CLI tools, step two there, and it will immediately package everything up. Um, and it packages up eventually into a container, uh, which can then sort of run on OpenShift in a, in a serverless manner, or even a, a non, or even not serverless. You, um, you can still get a lot of benefit from running at a much lower footprint for your integrations. So if you go to the next, oh, I will. So now I'm just going to share my screen and show you just a little. We can go back to the API designer. So this is the locations API, which um, Tom sort of had there as well. And what the API designer allows you to do is actually generate a Fuse Camel project. So if I click that, I now get a sort of a downloaded zip. Uh, and within that zip contains my project. Let me open it up. So here you can see, um, for those familiar with Java and Maven, you know, you get my your Maven POM file and you get um, the directory structure all set up. You get uh, the, and in particular, you get the camel context. Now I'll show you the camel context file. And, you know, while we're sort of also looking at those locations, you can see sort of there's different paths. It's taken what it can from that open API spec and produced you know, the the base template, if you like, for Camel. So immediately you're sort of getting the, the endpoints for those as specified in the API. Um, so it really is a quick start for a developer to, to go from an API contract to, you know, getting all that boiler template code, all this code scaffolding, getting all the project, which, you know, can typically, you know, uh, if, you, if you're not doing in that way, it can take, um, you know, half a day or so just to even work out, um, you know, align it with all the rest of the organization of how it works. So this is this approach gives you a consistent manner to, to um, you know, ensure even, you know, if you get new developers on board, it's, it's, a, it's a better quick start. It's a more consistent way of approaching uh, developing that API backend. So just go back to the slides. So, you know, with that generation tool, that actually, you, you don't need to sort of, you know, use the API designer to do that. There is actually a, uh, a Maven plugin which is sort of being used um, in the back end there. And that can easily take your um, open API spe specification. Uh, you can have it as a Maven plugin task, even, um, you know, independently. And what that does is generate that project code and scaffolding and source that you see there. So. Uh, you can see, you know, the difference between code first and contract first. With contract first, you know, I can easily get a consistent, reliable way of implementing my API backend. Thanks, Tom. Thanks, Ben. So that's really uh, powerful. The um, open API spec, you know, can can drive, you know, uh, significant uh, efficiencies into your application development and your uh, implementation by you know generating this boilerplate code so you're almost halfway there based on these generated artifacts uh, off the open API spec so now we're going to move on with the API lifecycle and the next two phases are not directly connected to the uh, contract approach but they are uh, touched by it so I'm going to briefly describe them rather than demo them um, with your open API uh, spec created 
uh, and assisted uh, implementation, as well as your open API uh, created um, API management configuration um, in order to uh, really drive uh, the efficiencies, as Ben mentioned, some of the best practices that go along with contract first. One of them is uh, automation. Now, automation um, in terms of deploying those artifacts, the API management and the API implementation artifacts uh, to production in a fully automated manner is facilitated by Red Hat's API lifecycle. In particular, there are two CI/CD engines that with OpenShift, you get an entitlement to and you get support for. They are Jenkins, which is probably the longest, most uh, well-known, most widely used CI-CD engine out there. It's more than 10 years old, but it's got a huge user base, so we provide it, but it's quite heavy in terms of its memory um, f uh, footprint that it requires. So for that reason, in the past couple of weeks, we've um, in the open uh, source community, Red Hat has contributed to a Kubernetes design from the ground up uh, CICD engine called Tekton. And with uh, that, you get a, a Red Hat version of that productized version called OpenShift Pipelines. So what these allow you to do, like I say, is to plug into OpenShift and to uh, be able to rapidly deploy your API management uh, configurations off the contract uh, into a production scenario. These are two examples, but you also could use other, any number of other uh, implementations, CI/CD engines, either on or off OpenShift, for example. Azure DevOps is a very popular CI/CD engine that's used with OpenShift as a deployment target. So a lot of flexibility there. Uh, in order to, for you to drive your contract-driven implementations uh, to production. Um, next, again, not directly connected to the API lifecycle, but worth, um, or not directly connected to the API contract, but worth a mention, is the ability to secure and to provide identity management around your API uh, end users, as well as your administration, your dev portal users. We provide Red Hat Single Sign-On, which is the productized version of the upstream Keycloak project, um, which can hold master identity, which can delegate out to enterprise systems like LDAP, LDAP or Active Directory, uh, delegate to uh, social logins like Google or Facebook, et cetera. And also it can act as a broker providing consistent interfaces and abstracting away the actual connection to other third-party identity providers like Okta, Ping, or Forgerock, uh, and others over OpenID Connect interfaces. So we provide that capability and that entitlement um, and that crucial aspect of the API lifecycle. So next we're going to talk about the management phase. And, and implemented there is uh, the uh, our API management uh, capability, which is Red Hat uh, three-scale API management which is really gonna form most of the rest of today's discussion and uh, demos. Uh, just to provide uh, an overview of how contract, of how it's gonna look in terms of what we describe and demo in contract-driven API management, we're gonna automate the configuration of API management using that open API contract as the basis. We have two options for that automation, uh, either the re three-scale RESTful APIs or the three-scale toolbox, which is a kind of a shortcut wrapper around popular API, RESTful APIs. That's what we're going to use in our demo. And when we use that open API, API contract, it basically automates the configuration of both the uh, administration portal and the developer portal um, in the process all at once. Um, so it's going to uh, going to illustrate how that contract first approach can really speed up uh, the activities that need to be done on the API management side as well. Um, before we get into any more demos, I just want to give a brief overview of the three scale API management uh, architecture. Basically, we have this um, two layered approach. The top layer is kind of the human interactions, the API consumer developer 
interacts with the developer portal uh, here on, on the left-hand side to figure out how to use the API and ideally to get a great consumer developer experience, read the open API specs um, and understand and quickly onboard. Um, then we have the administration side, which is uh, the uh, providers of the API management, the people who create the plans, the access rights, who can access what, uh, review analytics, apply monetization, um, set up credentials, uh, et cetera. Um, so these are the kind of human interactions all uh, driven off the API manager, which is the central um, controller, the control plane, if you like, where all the data, the config, uh, um, the intelligence uh, lies. So these are the kind of the top human interactions that would take place without an API contract or that are radically simplified with the API contract. Then at the bottom, we have the actual runtime flow, developer apps, web apps, mobile apps, consumer uh, uh, applications, IoT, whatever it might be that's consuming the API, makes call to the API backends. And what we provide is an enforcement port, a three scale enforcement point we talk, we describe as an API gateway. There are various options here. You can have an Nginx based reverse proxy as the API gateway, or you can plug into a service mesh capability and uh, have that act as your enforcer. Uh, but whatever way you do it, you should always have the enforcement point or gateway co-located in the same cloud region or data center as the actual API backend. And we facilitate that. We regard the API gateway as an infrastructural component. We don't charge for it. So we really allow you to optimally architect and always co-locate these two, minimizing latency uh, in the process. So that's the kind of the overview of how the three scale architecture uh, looks. Now we're going to start to get into a capability that Ben mentioned from the outset that is kind of part of API best practice. And we describe that as API as a, a product. It's effectively the ability to package collections of individual API backends. And now when we think these days in the days of microservices where you can have tens, hundreds, even sometimes thousands of individual containers um, acting as a API backends, even individual functions. Um, you need to be able to package those up and apply your API management on an abstraction we call a product that contains multiple API backends because um, unlike before you, where you had a small number of API backends, you could apply your API management at that level. But when you have hundreds and thousands, that's not a viable option. With API as a product, you package them up together um, and you apply your policies, your authentication, your authorization, your re review, your analytics, um, et cetera, at the product level. Um, it's a many-to-many -many relationship. Any product can have many product backends. Any backend can be in many products. So it's very flexible and we provide the ability to swap backends in and out. And you'll see how in a moment after we do the, the non-contract uh, based demo, you see after that how the contract based approach can really uh, simplify and uh, drive efficiencies into that uh, process. So um, that's where we are now. I'm gonna start to demonstrate here. Um, I'm gonna move over to pre-scale API management and what you can see here is we've set up, so I'm gonna demonstrate now API as a product in a very simple fashion. And what we're gonna do after is gonna demonstrate that using an automated contract driven approach. Um, we have one uh, product here, Flights, where as I mentioned, all of our API management is applied. Things like our um, analytics, I want to promote this, by the way. Um, analytics are applied um, at the API management level. We can see the 
the or at the API product level, I should say. Uh, we can see our traffic um, applications or consumers um, are there as well at the product level. Application plans, which are our access rights. Who can access what and how many times and if there's a charge um, done at the product level. Um, what uh, endpoints uh, are allowed. You can see here that we have a get catch all um, allowing any get to hit our product um, and obviously the back ends that belong to this product are listed here so you can see we have one version one of our back end flights available at the path latest so i'm going to illustrate how easy it is uh, to swap back ends in and out uh, of a product uh, invisible and abstracted away from the end user. This is the end user making a call, hitting that latest uh, path fragment that's going to resolve to our version one of our flights backend. That's our address there um, of our gateway. You can see version one here. So assuming that we just take a very simple example, we want to upgrade uh, from version one to version two, uh, we have no loss of service and no client impact we want to add. So we swap out uh, version one and we swap in version two at the same path. So the exact same uh, call can be made by the end consumer. And we simply promote this, this here. In other words, we're actually committing our changes down to our gateway. The way that works is our gateway has in my case, a three second uh, polling interval. Um, so every three seconds, it will check for a new change on the central manager, which it will find following my swap out of V1 for V2. And then it will pull down the config related to that change to the gateway. So three seconds later, which were well more than now, if I make this API call, exact same API call using the latest, this version one is going to be swapped uh out and version two is going to be returned here so very simple illustration of the api as a product providing that consumer facing abstraction and the ability to uh flexibly and without any uh end user impact as long as we don't break an interface uh we can flexibly um add remove back ends from our product so now what we're going to do following that context is we're going to automate the creation of a product and a backend off an API contract. And to do that, we're gonna use the three scale toolbox. I mentioned there's two ways to do it. You can use the three scale RESTful API or the toolbox. The toolbox is easier. It's a CLI here, command line interface we simply say we want to import an open API spec, specify some uh, properties here, like what type of credential we want to use, API key, we have a, um, a token, uh, and the actual address of our temporary test um, three-scale cluster for this uh, Alpha Days demonstration, followed by our open API spec. So when we make that call, and incidentally, this call, uh, to tie it back to our deployment earlier, would likely be placed inside of a CI CD pipeline, a Jenkins or a Tekton or an Azure DevOps to uh, basically provide this automation um, in, in a kind of a production ready manner. I'm illustrating it here on the command line just for uh, ease. So I've applied that. And what that's going to do is when it uh, gets going, it's created a new product. It has basically overwritten everything that's there. There wasn't anything there. And it's creating this, created a simple endpoint here called flights. And if I now switch back to my three scale uh, configuration, you saw before I only had one product and two back ends. If I refresh my screen here, you'll see a new back end and a new product is two box imported product and toolbox imported backend. Those have both been um, driven off 
the contents of that simple open API spec, all automated, taking the burden away from that, from the uh, humans and basically driving it off the open API spec. If I look at the product here, for example, you can see that it's a simple um, single endpoint uh, open API spec that contains that flights endpoint. There's a, an item, um, it's called a three scale method that um, whenever we send traffic, this is brand new, you, we just created it a few seconds ago, but whenever we send traffic to it, we'll see traffic appear here against that particular endpoint in the logical version of it. Uh, with regard to plans, it's also created, because it's created that method, I can create a new plan, uh, which I'll do now, and we'll call it flights plan, and we'll give it a, a system name um, as well. And if I drill into that, at that level, at that method level, we can apply pricing. Um, we can say uh, from various uh, steps of from zero to 10,000 calls, it's going to be priced at this much. And from there on, and a different price, for example. And we can apply rate, rate limits. On that particular endpoint, we can say in this plan that we've just created for this class of consumer, we can have multiple uh, plans for multiple different classes of consumer. This is the maximum that they're going to be allowed to hit. So uh, it really sets up uh, the um, config all driven off that open API. And then obviously the important, the third important aspect are, well, there's two more actually. It's created a mapping rule. So that's the actual path of our, um, that was contained within our open API contract. And now, and that's actually promoted down into our gateway, only this path will be allowed. Uh, obviously all paths that were, would be in the open API contract would get created and those would, would be the ones that would be allowed by the gateway. Um, so, so, for, so Tom, for the, if you think about it, you know, the open API spec they created within the design stage, a lot of it has been reused right up until this stage where you're starting to manage it with the API, albeit maybe they've added a, a backend URL. Speaking of which, Ben, um, the final aspect of what the uh, contract has applied to the administration side, and we'll deal with the developer side in a minute, um, is this back end, which was contained within the contract. And now that's basically the, the toolbox and the open API contract have basically glued those together, glued my product and my back end uh, together, and basically has given us quite a head start in terms of our work human work as an administrator, or we could also add to what we're doing using other automation tools, aspects of the toolbox, et cetera. So if you want to give us a, a recap then, uh, Ben. Yeah, so I, I guess just for, um, you know, if you didn't quite get it, you know, what Tom, um, have you done, if I understand correctly here, you've used the open API contract and you've used that actually to set up the the API definition, if you like, within the the API management tool uh, three scale. Um, so that that contract is you know the, the same as we saw in the original you know design phase that can feed right through in through the whole life cycle. Would that be correct? Exactly, exactly. It's the same contract, and it's driving these efficiencies and speeds to a lot of the different phases of the API life cycle. Um, so if we now actually switch back to our slides, uh, we're kind of nearing the end here. Um, this, these phases that are highlighted here are um, experienced by the consumer developers, those developers who are writing apps that are going to call our API. And um, that uh, toolbox call that created our administration components has also aided in the discovery and the ability to develop against and consume our APIs by those consumer developers. And let's show you uh, how, how that happens um, now. 
this is the three scale uh, developer portal. Um, and by, I'm going to sign in here, and by applying that uh, API contract using that toolbox call, uh, what it's done is it's made available our open API spec that we probably have added in extra documentation using the API designer um, to provide a great experience for those who are trying to onboard and learn about our API. Um, so there's only one endpoint. You can see here there's latest flights, international flights. Um, if we try it out here, and if I can locate my API key here, um, I can try that out, and you can see our familiar uh, response here with our new back end. Um, so again, this is all driven. This this the creation of this uh, open API GUI, uh, or they used to call it Swagger interface, um, all driven off the open API uh, spec. So you can have multiple different products with their documentation here, which allows that um, discovery to take place. Incidentally, we have a new capability um, called the service registry um, that's going to be uh, a central source of, of truth um, for not only open API specs, but also other, um, you know, asynchronous APIs. So, right? yeah, specifications, asynchronous APIs, Kafka uh, messaging formats, all those are going to be placed in this central um, registry called the service registry that's going to further kind of facilitate and uh, enable and make easy this contract driven approach that we're talking about today. Um, we've actually already dealt with the monetization and the uh, monitoring phase as I showed you in the API management. Uh, it's created those methods that will uh, be reported against and you can monitor them, the flight method and the same, the monetization is also facilitated. Um, by the creation of these methods on which charges can be applied. So that's really uh, the end of it for me. I'm going to hand to Ben, who's going to wrap up. Thanks, Tom. So you've, you've seen, um, you know, um, making API contracts central to the API lifecycle will really bring that faster and smoother lifecycle all around. And you've seen uh, in each part today where we've looked at that contract can influence, you know, design, mocking, testing, implementing, uh, deploy, secure, and managing. And then in the final section, you can see, you know, how it can help, you know, drive those documentation standards, help uh, discover those and, and consume those APIs. And it really, you know, from API strategy point of view, it sets the standards, you know, going forward within your organization for documentation, um, your how do you set up environments and uh, the fact that, you know, um, we're talking open API specifications specifically today, but, you know, it, it is sort of a general contract first. Um, uh, if you, There is a, like a large ecosystem that can support, you know, a lot of these aspects um, outside of the, the tools you saw today. So um, that is our wrap up. Um, we happy to open up for questions. I know we've got a little bit more time on our hands. Um, if there is any, um, feel free to put there it is, in chat. There is a question here, a great question from um, Arnav. I'll take the first uh, stab. I'll read the question and um, then you can chime in after uh, Ben. Yeah. Uh, does the contract first not break away from agile ways of development? Uh, in other words, it, can it not take a long time to define the requirements and make the perfect contract and if you create the contract the agile way, there'll be no uh, difference between contract first and code first. Um, so uh, you're right. If it was uh, designed in a, in a sort of a waterfall methodology that that contract needs to be fully planned and exhaustively worked over ahead of time, um, to before it's ever released, that would be quite a waterfall approach, and that would that is certainly not what we're advising here. Um, 
what we're advising is the creation of that contract, which is a living document that Ben indicated that when you uh, uh, also combine the automation tools um, the, uh, and also the ability to work in parallel by the different teams, it can, it can speed up and it can basically provide the point at which feedback can be uh, provided by whoever, by the end users, by the developers, etc. When you apply the automation to it, the uh, feedback loop can be much faster. And because we have all these automation capabilities and the ability to rapidly modify based on feedback, we can get to a satisfactory uh, contract and implementation much faster. But you're, yeah, so uh, I, I see your point, but we, we wouldn't apply the waterfall based um, treatment of that contract it'd be very much a living document I don't know did you want to add to that ben uh yeah absolutely so yes um i did sort of discuss that you know there is sort of an iteration um you know in that development of that contract but uh if you think about um you know test driven development for instance is that against an agile no we're just sort of developing the test sort of first as we go so this was sort of looking at contract first um, and it also spend, you could actually sort of, if you got that contract, you can um, start to develop that back end. You can start to have develop services that use that interface, but you can also start your integration testing as well against that contract. So, you know, there's, there's um, multiple benefits for producing this artifact in your life cycle first, but, um, which I think, you know, it, it can take some convincing people for sure. Um, and you don't have to choose your technology up front. That's, that's another r real aspect that, um, you know, if you're going down, you know, always the Java route, you're going to sort of annotate all your methods um, and, and, and go that way. But, um, you know, the, you sort of, you, you may not want to get stuck down there um, uh, doing it Java all the time, depending on, on your teams as well. So Exactly. Yeah, our ability to automate, iterate, modify fast, and repeat the whole uh, feedback and deployment loop quickly um, that the that the contract driven approach uh, provides uh, really can mitigate against a sort of a a slow bog down uh, approach that um, that it could potentially be without all this automation. I hope yeah. that answers your question or now. Um, does anybody else have any more uh, questions? No. Um, what have you seen? Um, the benefits of API contract. Have you seen sort of seen that uh, in um, people you've talked to recently, Tom? Yeah, uh, we have actually, um, and with uh, Red Hat uh, services, um, who are very much about agility and incremental um, approaches and fast feedback loops, it really does tie in well to to that that approach and you know the fact that it's all container based it's all automated it can be destroyed recreated from code uh, using devops and, and increasing the GitOps approaches really ties in to that uh these newer approaches that uh can um drive not only speed, but also much greater st stability and security into the de delivery of, of APIs and indeed, uh, yeah, any any sort of application really that, that we're seeing our customers deploy. How about you? Uh, well, I've definitely experienced the, the worst case of uh, code generation um, a few years ago. Um, <laughs> that sort of, you know, lends itself to a lot of back and forth. Um, you know, at the time we sort of started to do sort of API contract and 
um, that was a, definitely a welcome change just because everyone got on the same page, um, you know, rather than sort of looking at um, documentation, uh, you know, ways of documentation of, of how to do it, um, whether it was through documents or, you know, things like Confluence. Um, an API contract, you know, was a real artifact and it was, you know, documentation itself, Doc, you know, document as code is, is great yeah, from, from my perspective. Um, I would always encourage it if you can, you know, move, move down this path, it would uh, pay dividends for sure. Yeah, um, that's a, kind of a, a nice um, segue as well. I'm going to uh, <laughs> plug um, uh, an open chip meetup that's on in uh, two weeks time and it's all about GitOps, which is really just everything is code. We'll have a couple of our leading uh, solution architect, open chip solution architects and, and consultant, that's Wayne Dovey and uh, Mike Hepper. And so um, they're really uh, powerful communicators and advocators of this GitOps approach uh, that this sort of contract first approach really ties well with that I, that I mentioned. So I'd urge everybody to check out that meetup. It's on in about uh, two weeks time um, meetup and it's both the, the Canberra, the Melbourne and the Sydney meetups all in one. Yeah, uh, so we've combined all Australia now that we're under, exactly. under all these lockdowns, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, unfortunately, hopefully for not too much longer. So I think uh, Ben, we're we're at the hour at this point. Um, I think we can close it off. Uh, thanks everybody for coming. Ben, do you have any more final words? No, thank you everyone for um, yeah. It's um, hope you got what you needed out of it. Feel, feel free to email any of us. I'll I'll put my we'll put our email in the chat in case you're sort of have any questions hanging over uh, today. Um, yeah, thanks, Brett. Um, that's excellent. excellent. Thanks, Brett. So yeah, feel free to email. Um, we're uh, uh, happy to have a chat anytime. Um, particularly, this is sort of a, a key area for us. Um, okay, great. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Bye.